Hello there, right here, and in today's video, we will be looking at how to farm up five new items in the 1.17 Caves and Cliffs update. First is the Amethyst Shard, second is the Amethyst Cluster, third is the Lightly Weathered Copper Block, and fourth is the Semi Weathered Copper Block. And last, I'll show how to automatically farm Shulker Shells. We designed these farms up during our snapshot testing streams. Those are every Wednesday, where as soon as the new snapshot comes out, we update our server to the newest snapshot. You guys can actually join the server and me as we test out all the new snapshot things right as they come available. It was a lot of fun designing these farms up with you guys. Make sure you guys are subscribed as well as turn on your bell so you get notified of those streams. Let's first take a look at Amethyst Shard Farming. With the Amethyst, you can craft them up into block of Amethyst. It takes four of them to make one block. Or you can make the new spyglass, which takes one and two copper. It's also used in tinted glass, where it takes four of them with one glass to make two tinted glass. And to farm the shards, you first have to find a geode, which is one of these structures that generates down in the caves of the overworld. You might recognize it by this block on the outside, the tough block. They also have this calcite block along the edge. But the majority of it is made up of the block of amethyst. And there are some also very similar looking blocks, but they're a little bit different. That's the budding amethyst. And these are the blocks that grow out the actual buds. And when the budding amethysts get random ticked, they will produce these buds. So if we go ahead and crank up our random tick speed to a thousand, you'll be able to see these guys grow onto this pillar here. And they grow through four stages, small, medium, large, and cluster. Now there's a few different ways you can get the shards. All of them have to do with breaking the biggest size of the amethyst bud. You can mine it with a iron pick or higher. Or they'll break off and turn into items if they get pushed into a location where they're not supported. So let's push this one over, it breaks off, and each time it will give you four shards. Now you can increase the amount of shards it will give you by using fortune enchantment. If we mine this one, we got a, and we got 16 from a single cluster. I designed up this automatic amethyst shard farm. This uses pistons so the player doesn't even have to be around here. But since these grow with random ticks, the farm has to be within the player's random ticked area. And this is a cylinder shape around the player that is 8 chunks out every direction. And goes from the bottom world all the way to the top of the world. So if you build this somewhere underneath of your base, then they will be able to grow all the time. So this actually started out as a normal geode, just like this one here. And what we did is removed all the normal block of amethyst. I'll speed up with this command here and you can see what is left. And that is the other block and this is budding amethyst. These are the blocks you want to have in order to make your farm. Now these buds will only grow on sides that have air or water. They want as many sides of the bud to be cleared off. More areas to farm up the shards. After clearing away the area I went ahead and put in a set of four pistons around each of these blocks and because amethyst grows quite slow and I have all these pistons hooked up to a redstone wire which goes all the way back to a clock. Because their growth is determined on random tick they won't all grow at the same time but if you put a lot of delay down then it'll only activate the pistons and break them off when the majority of them are the large cluster size because this is one that provides the shards to prevent any of the items from landing on top of this one here since we're not using that one we can just place in a button there and that will prevent it from growing you don't have to worry about items getting stuck there and then when the piston activates it will push all the shards off and drop them downwards where the hopper minecart will go around picking them all up and the hopper minecart will come over here and unload the items into this chest here and then you can transport this to your base. Because you can't obtain the actual block that produces the shards, and you can't move it with uh, pistons, you have to use the layout of the buds that you can find. So it's best to find a geo that is quite large, so it has a lot of buds to choose from. And then what I did is I removed any buds that I wasn't going to use, and then just try to concentrate on the buds where I can actually push the items off and down to a single location. So all these are kind of pushing inwards. But there is chances that when it pushes, the items will fall on top of the other stuff that you have below it. So it's mostly just trying to make the best out of the geode you have. The setup is quite simple, but it might take you a little bit of time to wire this all up. Next up, I'll show you guys how to obtain the actual budding clusters. This is by silk touching them. It will produce one of the clusters. The amethyst buds are really cool because they have unique sizes not only for the bottom but also side and the top which I covered in the last video and you can place them down and they won't grow any bigger. I did say that we should be able to collect all the different sizes with a silk touch pick but currently only the largest one can be acquired. So in order to farm up these actual clusters we can't have pistons break them off because they only produce the shards. So I went ahead and designed an automatic amethyst luster farm. 
looks kind of complicated. That's mostly because the layout of the clusters to be farmed is very random. The way that I farm each of them is pretty much the same. I have the player sitting in a minecart and he'll be placed in front of one of them. And since each size has a unique collision box, you can choose to only break the biggest one. As the biggest one sticks way up here. So if you just aim at the top and you break it, it'll only have the player mine it when it gets that big. All the other sizes will be out of the reach of the player. So you can AFK here with your mouse button held down and can be confident that you only collect the ones that are fully grown. Since the player is riding inside of a minecart, he will mine objects at the speed he normally does. And that's why I have a stopping system here. And when he does break the crystal, it's going to update this observer, which is going to put power around, and then it's going to power this repeater, which is on four redstone ticks, and then that's going to give enough time for the minecart to leave the station and go into the next station. Let's go ahead and give it a try. Hop into survival and aim kind of high and then just hold right click and then it's going to power it and you just hold right click and it's going to go through all the different stations mining each of the clusters kind of cool to actually just watch your guy automatically mine them and the minecart take off right when he gets to the next one the player is close enough so you can pretty much pick them all up if you really want to, you can put like some kind of hopper system to also pick up any ones that your player maybe misses. I do have obsidian in other places just to try to prevent the player from griefing other things around it. But yeah, the player goes all the way around and goes back to the very beginning again. You can have the player go to as many of these clusters as you want or as few. It doesn't really matter. If you're really ambitious, you can hook up a couple of geodes together and go through all of them like this. It was pretty complicated to wire this up because every wiring is not identical. I had to kind of customize it for different situations. In some cases, I would run a rail in to an inclined rail to make the player get bumped up against the station where he's going to mine. Other times I would drop him from above so he lands onto the rail directly. I also use curve rails to advantage, making the player go one direction on the curve rail and then when he comes out of it, go a different direction. So using all these tricks, you can pretty much set up so you can get to any of the amethyst locations. In some cases you have to be kind of careful, like here I use redstone on that block right there. So I have to make sure I aim a little bit lower Still not low enough to affect any other sizes, so I don't mind that block there when this one would grow here. And the amethyst can grow on all six sides. To keep things simpler, I only mind the very top one. Now because these go through different growth stages, every time the little ones even grow, it's going to update the minecart and move it. But I don't have any counting system to make sure that they're fully grown. The player just keeps moving around and then he'll eventually find one that he can mine. This does mean you have to be careful because the player might be in a location where there's nothing. So you might be sitting here just mining in the background. So in each of the different locations, I make sure there's nothing in the background for the player to accidentally mine. If there is something in the background, make sure that's too far away so when he's in survival he's not able to mine it. You can't put like obsidian there because he would be able to mine the obsidian over time. So it really makes uh, farming these up quite a challenge, but also a fun challenge. I really had a lot of fun putting this all together and I even used some of the new blocks. I really like the weathered copper blocks and on this one I use the copper cut blocks which do look pretty nice as well. And I also use the amethyst blocks down here. The amethyst blocks aren't quite a solid block so you can't use them for bumpers. I don't know if that's a bug, they might fix it. Now I am using a diamond pickaxe, but you can use like obviously another right one. And I did give myself haste too, but you can use without haste because the player is sitting in a location where he's not going to move. So you can kind of use any speed of pickaxe and it will break it over time and then it'll send him off. So to make it so your player is always mining, even when you're not at the keyboard, you hold down your, your left mouse button and you keep it held down and then you press F3 plus T and when this screen comes up, you lift up on it. Now your player is always having it down. So I'm not holding your buttons down, but I'm going to move my mouse down just so I'm aiming at this guy. And you can see my guy is automatically mining it. And then that's how you pretty much do it. You just aim at the right spot and leave your guy AFK. Then when you come back from AFKing overnight, you'll probably have a whole bunch of the crystals. And then to stop it, just click again. Now you can also use this setup with your fortune pick. And this will give you way more shards than if they were broken by pistons. Problem is it does take the player. So in my opinion, I don't think it's worth it. I think it's better to just have a farm like this that can work while you're working on something else. Next, we're gonna take a look at how to farm up the lightly weathered copper as well as the semi-weathered copper. So there's four main types of copper. There's the normal copper, lightly weathered, semi-weathered, and weathered. 
Now to get the first one is pretty easy. You just craft it up and you will never have to worry about it converting or changing colors. And the copper will slowly go through these stages from the very cleanest all the way to the weathered. It takes about 66 Minecraft days to go through each transition. But if you don't want it to change to a different color, you can put wax onto it. So if you put wax onto it, then it won't convert over. So after you craft, you can wax it and then it'll be just like this forever. And if you want to get the last stage, which is the weathered one, you can just leave it set out and over time it'll eventually get there. But let's say you want to get these two stages and you want to keep them that way forever. That means you have to obtain it while it is this lightly weathered and then wax it so that it doesn't change. If you wait too long, it will convert down to this one. Same thing for the semi-weathered one. So I'll show you guys how to automatically get the lightly weathered as well as semi-weathered copper variants. Because those are the hardest ones to get. Now I'd recommend just working with the copper blocks because those can be crafted into cut copper and then that can be crafted into stairs or slabs. So just by converting this type, you can get all the rest of the types easily. Now the way that the copper blocks convert is is just through random ticks. So this big huge square that I made a while ago is slowly converting. And it's not necessarily just the blocks that are on the outside. Even the blocks in the inside will also be converted. Let's see if we can find some. Okay, there's one right there. So this block and all these blocks here are also completely surrounded by other blocks, but they still converted. So it doesn't have to be like on the surface. And this blob here is normal copper blocks. There's currently a bug in the game that even wax variants, this is all supposed to be wax, is also converting. So they'll probably fix that. So I designed this automatic farm here to get the lightly weathered, well as semi weathered ones. You guys might recognize this as the concrete converter that Activation and I designed. I changed it up so that it'll actually work for converting blocks over to different types. The way that it works, the player will be standing here. And let me just go ahead and reset this. And you sit in here and place in copper blocks. And this will just put them into a really big block over there. And this will put all the copper blocks into a big block over here. And then once it's all filled in, right before it's about to push, what we'll do is stop the player from placing in any more copper blocks by lifting up this trapdoor. The player is just sitting here right clicking and no blocks will be placed. And over here I have a counter that will count how many Minecraft days goes by. It's because the copper will change one stage between 50 and 82 days with an average of being 66 Minecraft days. So I got 82 items in there. Every time it's going to turn daytime, it's going to power this daily sensor, which is going to power this dropper, putting one item over here. So the player will just be sitting there waiting and all the blocks will be sitting here slowly converting over this time. And then eventually most items will end up on this side. And then when the last item leaves, it's going to activate the system. So let's go ahead and increase the time. Let's keep adding a thousand to time into, until it turns daytime. Okay, and now it's going to set up so that the next blocks that are placed in by the player are going to activate it. So notice that this trap door is now flipped downwards. So the player who will be standing here would automatically go back into lighter mode and be able to place in some more blocks and this is going to activate the TNT and this pushing system is going to push it and blow them up at the same time and all the items are going to end up down here in this chest but after that time they would be either converted into the lightly weathered or the semi weathered depending on how long you let them wait allowing you to automatically get all the variants of the copper the way that I had this set up is that it'll go through this whole cycle two times and then you'll see the trapdoor lift up once again and now you would have to reset the system by moving the items back over again. I might automate that part as well later on, but currently it takes about two in real life days for the copper to convert and four if you're trying to get the semi weather one. And since you can do this two times in a row, you can AFK this as long as eight in real life days before having to move the items over. So it's not so bad. This is just to get the different variants automatically. You still have to obtain the copper and craft it into copper blocks for the system to convert it. But it's actually a really handy system with counters in here and pushing devices and also there's a TNT duper which is breaking the copper blocks off. And we initially designed this for Exumavoy for concrete converter but you can pretty much use this to blow up any type of blocks that you want to with a little bit of modification. Now you can detect the change of the copper with observers but since we're working with large amounts of copper that we're trying to convert it makes more sense to do it on a time basis rather than individual basis. We looked at how to farm up shards as well as clusters and two different types of weathered copper. Lastly, we'll take a look at how to farm up shulker shells. If you guys see my last two videos, I showed how it's possible to get infinite amounts of shulker shells by using a new mechanic in 1.17 to do with shulkers splitting off. The way that the mechanic works is if a shulker 
is open and a shulker bullet hits the shulker, he will then attempt to split and produce a second shulker. But before he actually makes a second shulker, he tries to find a spot for him to teleport to. He will check five different locations in this area. And if he is able to find a location, he will be able to teleport to the new location and the other shulker that split off of him will be left behind in the old location. So now you end up with two shulkers that came from one. Now the shulker will also check this area to see if there is other shulkers already in it. And if there is five other shulkers in this area besides him, he will never be able to split off and produce more. And all this information about shulker splitting came directly from the code. Eli and Chirico just checked it for me and Eli even made this chart here which shows the more shulkers that there is around the initial one, the more likely it is to fail in producing a second shulker when it's hit by a bullet. So if there is zero extra shulkers around in the 17 cubed area centered on the shulker, then there will be a 100% chance that he will split and produce another one if he can find a location to teleport to after five attempts in this area. Every time the shulker does get hit by the bullet, he does take some damage. So you don't want to have too many failures and ideally you want to have zero failures which we can do if there's no other shulkers in this area and there is a lot of surface area for the shulker to split off and teleport to so the idea is to have one shulker have him shoot a bullet and hit himself with a bullet have a lot of area for him to split to but also get rid of the shulker that teleported away as fast as possible so you don't have to worry about him counting towards the checking area so during our eight hours of live stream we designed quite a few shulker farms to take advantage of this so with this setup here, we have the shulker kind of isolated by himself. Then we have to make the shulker try to shoot at something. So the player or a snow golem can sit over here and snow golem get mad at the shulker since he is a hostile mob and tries to shoot at it. Shulker will try to shoot back at the snow golem. So he'll produce these shulker bullets and then he will try to kind of guide them towards the snow golem. It doesn't have a lot of room in here since it's mostly enclosed. Where he sees he has most room is going backwards so his bullet will go backwards then it will see that there's a dead end here and then it'll try to go the other direction and end up hitting the shulker. He doesn't try to shoot forward because he sees these doors here which are occupying the space but his bullet can still try to pathfind through it and there is a small slit here which a snow golem can shoot between this gate and the slab here to hit the shulker. And you can see the shulker is splitting off when he gets hit by his own bullet. The bullet does try to go him over here. It'll just hit up against this gate here. You can see right there the bullet couldn't figure a way to get out. So it just hit up against the corner. So the area where these guys can teleport to is underneath. And there's quite a bit of room for them to find this location. But because they're checking a 17 by 17 area, even having this whole floor dedicated to them means that they will fail sometimes. Because they only check five times. And if they don't find it within five times, then they're going to end up hurting themselves. If they have less than 50% health, they have a 25% chance of teleporting away and not producing a split of themselves. We also put in a system that can detect when there is no shulker up above and will waterlog this area so then it will make these guys either teleport up there or kill any extras down here in the water. Any shulkers that die, the shells will end up in the center and we have a hopper mining cart that picks them up and puts them into the chest over here. Here's another design that was designed up during the stream by one of the viewers where it has a lot more surface area for them to teleport to. In this design here, we have a lot more surface area for them to teleport to than the other one. The initial shulker will be right here in the center. Then the area where he is checking, we got tons of open area. There's two gaps of air here. The shulkers, when they teleport to area, they check it very similar to like a shulker box. They want to make sure that there is at least one block and half a block for them to be able to consider that valid location. So if I put a shulker right here, you can see that he considers it a good location. He doesn't try to leave it. But if I would put this block in above him, you see he will immediately try to teleport away. So this layout that I made down here is the most surface area that you can put in this 17 by 17 area. So there's a lot of area for him to teleport to and even in the center we had to block off some of it to protect these guys. But I put in some more fins here where shulkers could teleport to even the sides of these. We also have a similar setup here where the snow golem is over here, the shulker is over here. We have some gaps in the back where he can let his bullet travel a little ways away from him before turning around and hitting him. We have a gap above him so he can open up. The trapdoors let the snow golem hit him and then his bullet won't try to go over here. The snow golem also has a slab where he's standing at so the shulker doesn't attempt to teleport to where he's at. So after the shulkers have teleported into these areas here, we have a timer which is coming in 
and flooding the area so that they no longer see it as a bell location to stay at. They will attempt to teleport out and we have an extra chamber on the outside here which is a spot where the shulkers can see and will teleport to. And once they're out here, they're no longer within the range that the initial shulker checks. So it won't cause the shulker to fail. And we have this whole system on a timing device. So what we do is we let the snow golem see the shulker and shoot at it. That will produce an extra shulker. Then we have a system that comes down here and pushes this glass block inside of the snow golem. So he's not shooting at the shulker while we're flooding the chamber because when it's flooded, it's holding up locations for the shulker to teleport to. So if he would get hit during this time, it's a good chance he could fail. Then when the water is removed, we open it back up so that the snow golem can start shooting him again. And once they split off, we will flood it again to get them to teleport over to here. Clock itself is a hopper clock here that will determine the delay between floods. Then I added in this little weird device that actually works pretty nicely. It's for extending signals. The way that this works is that the items are sitting over here and as soon as the power is released it lets the items slowly move their way back over to there which gives enough time to extend the pulse. So it's pretty much a pulse extender but it uses the fact that the comparators take a little bit of time to send signals through so this redstone block will actually prevent any signals coming through even though there's items in here until it's time for them to be moved into other one. Kind of strange but it works really good and I might actually use this more in the future. Then the power just comes through all the trap doors and opens them up for enough time so that the whole thing floods with water. Then it closes them again. There's also some blocks over here just to let the water be able to go down and push them all out and no places for them to hide. So if we look in the side chambers here we see all of the shulkers and then these guys can be flooded with these trap doors here at anytime you want to to get the shulker shells and then underneath of the system we have some rails which a hopper minecart going back and forth picking up all the items you can choose to either kill them in this location or you can kill them in the initial location but to speed up the farm it's best to get them to teleport away before killing them the downside to this system is that all this water going up and down is creating a lot of updates which produces a lot of lag in this design we took advantage of the same concept as my advanced blaze farm or my underload farm where the mobs will spawn nearby or directly inside of the Another portal and immediately be teleported so they no longer count to the mob cap. Now we're not really dealing with the mob cap but we are dealing with the individual shulker cap which is five shulkers. We actually want to keep it down to zero extra shulkers so we want to teleport away as fast as possible. In the shulker shell shucker which is the shulker farm that we actually designed several years ago we get infinite amounts of shells without using any mods. We showed that it's possible to transport shulkers pretty easily through nether portals but they will only teleport to areas that have air so they won't teleport directly onto the rim of this nether portal but you can force them to go there by pushing them with like a piston or dropping them out of like a minecart. But during the production of the shulker shell shucker I discovered this really weird bug that I showed you guys back then which is when mobs get damaged near a portal they'll actually somehow like wobble a little bit and then end up touching the portal and getting teleported through the portal so if i go ahead and do this again you see that he gets teleported by the portal that is beside him even though if he would open up his head is not going to touch it at any point and the shulker is actually making it over into other dimension he's not just getting like teleported away because of the damaging snowballs which can occur that's not what's going on here we actually initially used this in the shulker shell shulker to get them to teleport through end portals but we later came up with the easier method which was to move them with minecarts and drop them directly into the portals. So in the center here we have the same kind of setup as we have in the other one where the snow golem is here and the shulker is over there and every time he splits off his splits are ending up on one of these huge surface areas to teleport to but remember when the shulker does hit the original one gets teleported away that means he is damaged meaning he's going to have that little bit of wobble and he's also most of the time also extended so that he's standing up taller. So he'll like teleport over here and then he will will be tall. And as soon as he's tall, he's going to touch the portal and teleport away. Or the damage itself, him wobbling, will actually get him teleported. And because the nether portal itself doesn't have a collision very similar to string, they will see this place as a bell location to teleport to. If this was all filled in with blocks, they would not be able to teleport to here. That way we can fit in blocks besides portals pretty close together. And I set this up so that it is the most blocks for surface area that the shulker will check. And even here where we're having the snow golem and the shulker, other than protecting them with some blocks so that the bullets don't come back and kill the snow golem, there is still a lot of area here for them to teleport to and be put over into another dimension. Now because the initial shulker here gets damaged, he will wobble, so we can't have another portal blocks right beside him. So I put in just a post of obsidian, made two portals here. 
So these locations here had to block off with buttons. And since the button block is there, it's not an air block and you won't be able to teleport there. That way you don't have to worry about him getting a location where he can't be removed. So every location that they teleport to will take them into the nether so we don't have to worry about them building up. And there should be a 100% chance of the stalker getting a split every time he gets hit. So you can see the bolt going back, hitting him, he's splitting off. He does split the new shulker that's put into his place is closed already. So it may appear that he like really quickly closes, but it's actually the new one where the old one will be taken away. You do see the bullet sometimes go back and forth quite a bit. I tried quite a few different setups to prevent the bullet from accidentally hitting like other random locations other than hitting himself. And this seemed to be about the best setup. The snow golem also won't try to move into the portal because he won't get hit. And I do have a trap door in there so no shulker will teleport to him. And he's also encased with blocks all the way around in case a bullet comes and like hits him. Like this bullet is trying to hit him. The shulkers have a tendency of telling other shulkers where the enemy is. They're all trying to shoot at the same target. Get. And I have some slabs and stairs here to prevent locations for the shulker to sit on the side of here and put buttons on top so they don't sit on the top sides of these either. That way they're always facing towards the portal and get teleported. There's a lot of cool designs made by the viewers as well, like Death and End made a stackable design. You could put a second one of these modules just underneath of it and lower the portals down too, so you can have almost twice the rates with almost the same amount of room. But I definitely think there's room to improve upon these. Another thing that we discovered during the making of the shulker shell shulker is that when shulkers get teleported into another dimension, it won't teleport to the same location that the portal takes them. So let's go through this portal here, and what happens is the shulker kind of ends up inside of this portal block here, and what he'll try to do is find a location to snap to. If he can't find a location to snap to within the first game tick, then he will be sent to the overworld coordinates applied to the nether. This was a big problem we ran across during the first shulker shell farm that we made. The way we overcame that one is that we would immediately pick up the shulker when he ended up on this dimension. The way we solved that one is we would immediately scoop up the shulker with a minecart as soon as it came into a different dimension. But we initially actually made a huge sponge thing that had tons of surface area hoping them to snap to one of the areas during that one game tick. But we never actually used that. Now we could try to apply that to the nether side here, make them snap to that. But there is a chance that they will fail to find a location. Then we would just have to end up picking them up at the location of the overworld coordinates applied to the nether. So we might as well just go there and build a killing chamber. So if we run this command here, it will take the overworld coordinates and just apply them to the nether. So if we go ahead and teleport over into the nether, this exact same location, you can see something going on here. So the shulkers that come from the farm are just being placed in mid-air because they couldn't find a place to snap to at another location. So they end up over here in the air and they're spaced out because they went through different nether portals. But just like they were all able to teleport away from the center of the initial shulker, they're also able to teleport back to the initial location. So right here we have one low block area which is a valid location for them to teleport to. We have 24 minecarts there, which is giving them max cramming, so they're dying very quickly. Then we have a hopper minecart inside that block, picking up any loot above it, and then putting all the shells into here. You can see it produces a lot of shells. Minecarts are kept in place with these bars, so they can't accidentally get pushed. And we also have buttons around here to prevent them from teleporting to the other side. So you can see slowly the shulkers are able to search for places to teleport to. And even though there's one little location here, they have nowhere else to teleport to, so they just keep searching until they find this location. Then they teleport here. Now there's a 50% chance that a shulker will give off a shell. It doesn't have to be killed by a player. Looting would help, but it's a lot easier to just run this automatically. And if you want to keep the number of shulkers that are sitting around here to a minimum, you can just put in more of these stations so they have more surface area and more likely to teleport there and die more quickly. Now in the past you could put shulkers right beside each other, but in 1.16 they change it so that any shulker that is within one block of another shulker will attempt to teleport away from them. We can't store them as closely together anymore. Now if you have the shulker as well as a snow golem and entity processing chunks like inside your spawn chunks, this thing can actually run 24-7 on servers. Or if you're a single player, it will run your spawn chunks as long as you're in the overworld. Now using the trick that I discovered with interdimensional chunk loading, the nether side of this farm can also be loaded. And it will load the chunks around where the mobs come through the portal. So mobs go through the portal, they're going to load the chunks around where they initially wanted to spawn. And since if you build this up in your spawn chunks, your spawn chunks are near 0-0. Zero, zero. If you go into the nether side, they're even closer to there. So any entities that go through there will load chunks near 0-0 zero, zero in the nether. I mean that you can set it up so that even this location, which is the, the overall coordinates applied to another, is within the area that is being loaded by using my chunk loading trick. So this whole thing can go on 24-7 without even players online. And you can get tons and tons of shulker shells from this. 
Well, this is definitely going to be something really fun to build up on the project server, as the Shocker Shell Shocker no longer works in versions 1.15.2 and above. And we might even build this up on Proto Sky because we'll probably update that to 1.17 before Prototech. That way we can get Shulkers a lot more easily. So we'll try to give you guys world downloads of everything we built here, but it was built up on our snapshot testing server, which for some reason is very laggy during this snapshot. So I had to keep my vendor distance pretty low. I will try to move the structures over to a single player world and give them as a world download. And I will be doing more videos covering any changes that the devs do to try to maybe combat the easiness of farming these items, as well as give more in-depth explanation to each of these farms. So make sure you guys check the description for newer videos. I really enjoyed building these up during our snapshot testing streams. And I do stream every Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So make sure you follow me on Twitch. It doesn't cost anything. You don't miss out on those interactive streams. So that's how you're able to farm up the shards, the clusters, the weather copper, as well as shulker shells used to make shulker boxes. We'll be designing more different types of farms using the new mechanics. I don't want to design anything too complex that might get changed, as it will be working on 1.17 for almost an entire year before we see the full release. So make sure you guys are subscribed so you don't miss out on all the development of the snapshot during that time and the cool stuff you can build using it. I really appreciate if you leave a like on this video as well as share it with others, as I put a lot of time into each of my videos. I would like to thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.